to assurance of salvation. Now, I have purposely positioned this chapter right after the last one because invariably, when a person gets saved and they give their life to Jesus, the enemy comes in and begins to plant doubt. He's a master at that. That's the chief trick of his trade. If you recall back in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, there in the garden. It was Satan, disguised as a serpent there in the tree, that used doubt. He began to plant doubts in Eve's mind. He would say, has God surely said? And so she began to play with that, and that was his way into her heart. She began to doubt God. And once she bit that, bite, that bait, she went all the way in with it. So Satan is a master of deceit with trickery, lies, and he wants to plant doubts into our mind. What does he want us to doubt? He wants us to doubt God's wonderful word, his promises. And he'll throw terrible experiences into our lives, sometimes tragic experiences, where you say, where's God in all of this? Pastor Jack started a series of study last night, Wednesday night, on, on the life of Joseph. We were there. It's a great series. Well, Joseph had every reason to doubt God, didn't he? With all that he went through. And it wasn't just a momentary thing. It went on for years and years and years. And so Satan wants to plant doubt into our minds to get us to doubt God's truth and no longer rely upon it. So I want to give you tonight some great scriptures that come from God's word that will give you absolute assurance that you're saved and will always be saved, okay? Because the doubts will come. First of all, how do I know that I'm saved? We know that we're saved based upon what Jesus did upon that cross. Early on, about 650 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah foretold the coming of Jesus and why he would come. He said in Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, as you and I, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And as a result, the Lord has laid upon him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. You see, we were like lost sheep, scattered, with no direction whatsoever. And God, in his infinite love for us, sent his own son, Jesus, to come into this world, to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And then God could gather up his sheep, you and I, and make us his very own. When Jesus died upon the cross, he paid the complete price for our sin. Peter would write, for Christ also suffered once, notice that word once, once for sin, the just for the unjust. He being the just one, he suffered for us the unjust ones, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Jesus died once for our sins. As a result, in his death, he satisfied the complete requirement of God's law. 1 John chapter 4, 9 and 10 says, In this the love of God was manifested or made known toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation is not an everyday word today, certainly. It basically means satisfaction. It's what Jesus did satisfied God's requirements of his own law. He alone justified our lives. Salvation is based upon what Jesus did. It's also based upon the promises of his word. There are Romans chapter 8. I love Romans chapter 8. One of my favorite chapters of the Bible. If you ever have a really downer day, discouraging day, just immerse yourself in Romans chapter 8 because we're told they're all that God has done for us. But it, it, it's kind of a, it's, it's rather interesting because it kind of builds like a crescendo, like a musical melody. It just keeps building and building and building. And finally you get to the last couple of verses and you read these words here in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, where Paul says, I am persuaded, based upon what he said earlier, I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Now I'm going to kind of define these terms here for you. Here we have a, a pair, death and life. You were born at some point in time, you will die at some point in time. Those are the bookends of our life. Between those two points is our earthly existence. So that's the first definition of terms here. Next we read, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. You may not be familiar with those terms, aside from maybe angels, principalities, and powers. Well, those are angels as well. You see, in this unseen world, the spirit world around us, there are angels. There's angels here tonight, here in this room, believe it or not. There's also what I call the not-so-good angels, demons, the Bible calls them. They are the ones that are trying to rob us of our faith, pull us away from the Lord. And they're equally as well, they're here this evening as well. But praise the Lord, God and His grace got you here, and they didn't win. <laughs> they went down tonight. But nonetheless, they're here. So, principalities and powers. Now, in this unseen world, and the Bible says a lot about this, places like the book of Daniel, the book of Job, and so forth like that, we see, we see that there's these unseen beings. They're like the, the puppeteers that pull the strings of the puppets. The human beings upon the earth are the puppets, but behind it all, what you can't see, are the puppeteers pulling their strings. And so there's this demonic structure that rules the world, the principalities and powers. Now, if you go back east here in America, you will find that they, they call towns principalities. Not so much out here on the west coast, but back east they do. Townships, principalities, and things like that. It's an old term. And so the Bible uses that term as well because for these areas of civilization, you have principalities. And over those civilizations, you have these demonic powers that rule them. And so there are demons that rule every part of man's government, of his universe as he knows it, our own government here in the country, the media, you name it. It's all under Satan's control. And so you have the good angels, which are given to us to help us, and you have the bad angels who want to oppose us. And so we're told here that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities powers this unseen world, nor things present nor things to come, <clears throat> things present well, things present are what you're now experiencing at the very moment. Things to come, you don't know anything about. I always say to people, you know, we can see in the future about as far as the end of our nose. That's it. That's as far as you can see. Beyond that, you don't know what's going to happen. So from here, the present, all the way to the future, that's the next term. Bear with me on this. The next thing we read, nor height nor depth. Let me ask you, how far up is high? How far up? <laughs> goes in, goes forever, right? Or how far is down, you know? goes forever, right? Well, those are two infinite points, right? You can't begin to measure those two distances. So, within that, nor any other created thing. What is that? Well, God alone is the creator. He creates all things. And anything and everything outside of him is a product of his creation. You and I are the product of his creation. Angels, good and bad, are the product of the creation. Even inanimate objects like the chairs you sit on and the tables that you have are a product of his creation. He made the raw materials. He gave man the wisdom to know how to put it together. It's the result of his creation. So anything outside of God is any created thing. Well, that pretty much covers it all, don't you think? Some distant planet, here at home, whatever, it's all part of God's creation. Now the point he's trying to get across is there's nothing in all of God's creation from this point in time all the way into the infinite future. Whether we fight demons or whatever our enemies might be, there's nothing in your lifetime from this point forward that will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now I emphasize that because through the years of being a pastor and just dealing with people, I have had so many people say to me, I don't think God loves me anymore. Or God doesn't love me. And I'll ask him, well, will you open up your Bible and show me and prove to me that God doesn't love you? Because I can prove it otherwise. And here's one such verse. That there's nothing in all of God's creation that will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's impossible for God to ever stop loving you. Do you get that? It's impossible for God to ever stop loving you. You see, we're told in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord and I change not. Now, if God loved you at one point in time, to the point where he brought you to the cross and you gave your life to Jesus, 
And at some other point in time, you decide to turn your back on the Lord like David did here, he talked about. That changed God's love. I am the Lord, I change not. You see, there's nothing that you and I can ever do that would force God to stop loving us. If we could do that, we would force God to change. And we would be more powerful than God. Because God's word says, I am the Lord, I change not. God cannot change. And so therefore, nothing could ever happen that would alter God's love for you. Now, circumstances might come around that get be pretty grave, and you wonder, where is God in all of this? That's when people get so detached from God that they begin to question the validity of his word. That's why it's important to be so close to him and so close to his word that these verses become glued to your life because they become the anchor to your soul. Knowing again that we were saved not by our works, but by God's grace. It's a gift. And you will continue to be saved by God's grace. Not by works, but by grace. Titus would write, or Paul would write to Titus, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. How did he do that? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ came into your life, he washed your sins away. And you were, you were regenerated. You were made brand new. You were born again. Generation means, or to generate means to, to make something brand new. When you're regenerated, you were born again a second time spiritually. So salvation is based upon God's promise. Also, the Bible says that we can know that we're saved. So often, you know, when I witness to people, I'll ask them, are you going to heaven? And if they're not saved or they're not sure of their relationship with the Lord, they'll more often not say, well, I hope so. Well, that's my clue to share the gospel with them. Because I'll say, you know what the Bible says? That we can know so. We can know that we're saved. 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have, notice the word have there, past tense, have eternal life. It's not some future thing. The moment that you're saved, you have eternal life. If you've given your life to Jesus, you possess eternal life. It's not some future thing. You have it now and that you may continue to believe on the name of the Son of God. These things have I written. Well, i got to read, go back and read, and, and read what was written. But I'm told that if I read that, and the fact that they were written, I can know that I'm saved. I have eternal life. So the Bible is very clear. We can know that we're saved and going to heaven. But as many as received him, the gift, Jesus, to them gave you the right to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. Receiving, if you've received the gift, you've got the gift of life. When I got saved 50-some years ago, <clears throat> I don't know that I could really quote you a Bible verse at the time. I didn't know any Bible. But the moment I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, I was completely all alone. The moment I prayed and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and forgive me of my sins, at that moment, I knew I was saved. I just knew I was saved. I had no doubt whatsoever. Now I come to understand how that happened. Because I'm told at the bottom of the page 9 here, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, the moment that you give your life to Jesus Christ and you invite him to come into your life, he does so by way of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, three persons, one God. And so the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And that's what he did with me that night. He came into my life. And I'm told that he bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So he comes into our life. And he begins to bear witness with us and say, Lyle, Richard, Irene, David, Nancy, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. He begins to give off that message. We're saved. And that's how I knew. I still couldn't push you much of a Bible verse, but I knew I was saved because the Holy Spirit had come into me. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful assurance that God has given to us. 
We read over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. This is pretty inter interesting here. In him you also trusted. Now notice the progression of terms here. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now let me lay this out for you. It is so fascinating. You hear the gospel. You respond. You call upon the Lord. He comes into your life. And we're told that when he does, you are sealed. You are sealed. Now, in today's modern age, so to speak, we can't really relate and understand the term as much. But transport yourself back maybe a few hundred years. You have to go back to your history books. When the mail service was radically different than what we have today. Say the king, big important guy, wanted to get a message out to somebody. So here he is with his parchment, and he has his little feather quill pen thing here, you know. And so he writes the message on this parchment. And when he's all done, he rolls it up. Now, put your thinking caps on. What did your history book teach you? What does he do next? He seals it with a wax and seal. Exactly. Happened to have a candle handy. Dipped it over there. Sealed that seam with wax. And then what does he do? He puts this in the seam. Well, you're sharp, Irene. I like you. <laughs> yeah, he has that unique ring that only he has, right? And he presses the image of that into that wax. So that when he gives it to the messenger to have that delivered, he sees, oh, that's not any ordinary seal there. That's the king's seal. What well, speaks of the fact this is the king's property. You better not be tampered with or I'm going to be in big trouble, you know. It's sealed for a person, for a reason. And so it's delivered to the recipient, and he sees that seal. Oh, my goodness, this is from the king. When you gave Jesus your life, God sealed you. Hopefully there's some changes taking place. As that seal was impressed upon that wax, it changed the shape of that wax. When the Holy Spirit comes into our life, hopefully our lives begin to change. The old habits hopefully are going away. Sometimes old friends change or have to change in a relationship. Everything begins to change. In fact, your memory verse for next week is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hopefully things are changing in your life. Why is that? It's because the Holy Spirit has come into you. And now by the Holy Spirit, God is pressing that unique image of his son Jesus down upon your life and his whole purpose and plan is to conform you to the image of his son according to Romans 8 29 he wants to make you and I just like Jesus long suffering patient loving you go on and on you think about Jesus forgiving all that he's changing us that's because God by the Holy Spirit is reshaping our lives. He's pressing that emblem down upon us and making us like his son. But there's another aspect of this. We're told, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That word promise is interesting. In the Greek language, which is the original language of the New Testament, is the word erebon. Arabo. Now, if you live in the Greek culture and you heard that word, you would think bride price. You see, in those days when people proposed, or when one proposed to another, there was a price involved called a bride price or a dowry, a down payment, so to speak, that was paid. You see, you and I were bought with a price. The price of Jesus, his son. Now, for some of you, any, anyone here unmarried at this point? Oh, quite a few hands going up there. 
Anybody would like to be married at this point? No, I see it. Okay. <laughs> well, my, my daughter just got engaged. And uh, she's not at all bashful showing off her ring. You know that? I mean, when, if you ever seen a, a, a woman who just freshly got engaged come into work or something like that, well, how are you doing? Nice to see you today, you know? No, first thing is, oh, nice to see you, you know? <laughs> And oh my goodness, they go nuts. They, oh, gotta see the ring, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> you see, that's that's the token, the symbol that we use today, the promise. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you became the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. He's our bridegroom. And there's another wedding that's going to happen in the future called <clears throat> the wedding of the Lamb. For we, the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, will be wedded to him. Now, until that day comes, we are in this engagement period. And going back to our verse here, we have the word promise or parable. You see, Jesus has promised us to him. He's promised that he's coming back one day and he'll receive us unto himself. Now, as a as a would-be groom gives this ring to a would-be bride, it's a symbol of promise. I'm taken. I've been promised. When Jesus sends his Holy Spirit into us and he begins to change our lives, that's like him putting an engagement ring on us. We're taken. We've been promised. And there's coming that future day when we will be with our bridegroom and we'll be wedded to him permanently and forever. So that's why it's important to be born again, to have the Holy Spirit in you, so that you can be a promised bridegroom to Him. And so with these changes that are hopefully taking place in your life, be encouraged by that. And just think of it as God's engagement ring that He's put upon you. Isn't that glorious? So you've been stamped with His seal. Now God's seal is tamper-proof. No one can tamper with God's seal. You see, we have been promised forever to him, and we've been sealed forever by him. So that's a very important verse. In fact, moving down the line here, we have this verse, um, um, Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God who is living in us, whom you were sealed. Now notice for how long. You were sealed for the day of redemption. <clears throat> you see, God paid the price for our lives. He's paid the price for our sin. And positionally and figuratively speaking, yes, we have been paid for it completely. But we're still in these sinful bodies. We still live in this sinful earth. We're not in heaven yet. And our full redemption is not complete. Yeah, we have the promised redemption, but it's like we're still in these sin-cursed bodies. One day the Lord will take us home and be with Him. At that day, it will be our completed day of redemption. So we're told that we are sealed for how long? Ephesians 4.30. We are sealed until that day of redemption. You see the tamper-proof aspect of this? We're sealed until that day. And you're not going to get loose. I don't care. What happens? You're not going to get loose from the Lord. You're his property. And God is not one to throw people in the garbage. We're sealed. We're told, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. The Holy Spirit. I praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. He just is speaking verses to me all throughout the day. Oh my goodness. I'm in a situation, you no, know, I can't, like yesterday, what was I thinking about? Something happened. Oh, I couldn't find my glasses yesterday. <laughs> I was like, working in my house. I, well, you know, you have those moments. I, I can't find my glasses, and i got to get in my car and come down here to the church, and I can't find my glasses, and i got a time schedule, and oh my goodness. But then I thought, the Holy Spirit says, you know, God knows where those glasses are. Why don't you ask Him? So I stopped, started praying, God, you know where those glasses are. I can't find them. I look everywhere. I can't find them. <laughs> in five seconds, He said, go in this room upstairs. And I go up there, and you're right there. <laughs> The Holy Spirit. The Holy, Holy Spirit said, pray. Pray. It's so cool, isn't it? I love it. 
Now, why do I doubt that I'm saved? Going back to the original story there in Genesis 3, the serpent. We read in Genesis 3, 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said? He begins to plant doubts. And that's what he did. And so as he began to play with her thoughts, he eventually was able to get into her. And she, she sinned because she doubted God. Now, in that particular instance, Satan was very clear and defined. There was no fooling, you know, as to who he was. But he can disguise himself. He's the master of deceit. He's the master of disguise. Because we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, for such are false apostles and their deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. It's amazing. He can put on, you know, brilliantly white clothes and disguise himself. He's like the original Trojan horse. And you know, he'll even use really good-looking religious people. I mean, where do false teachers come from, right? He populates the earth with false teachers who look really good on the outside. And a lot of people go after them simply because they don't read their Bible. If you don't read your Bible, you'll be fooled. That's why we've got to really know God's Word. What does he do? Well, there in Revelation 12, 10, we get some insight into Satan's activity. What does he do? We read here, for the accuser of our brethren, speaking of Satan, who accuses them, that's us, before our God, day and night, has been cast down. Now, this is a future thing that's going to happen. But for now, for whatever reason, which I don't have an answer for, Satan have access, he has access into heaven. And he and God talk. Why? I don't know. But nonetheless, that is true. Read Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. You'll see a real life scene in heaven. And what does he do? He accuses us all before God as being unfit of his love. Unfit. He says, that loud guy, you know, he is so flaky. I mean, he's just up one way, down the next. There's just no way that you can love him. I mean, all kinds of lies like that. But he's a master of lies. And say, yes, Irene. So was Satan cast down before creation even started? Satan, he was actually alive before creation. He was one of God's perfect creatures. You read about it in Ezekiel chapter 28, before his fall. And um, he was probably the most gifted of all of God's creation. Wisdom, music, talent, ability, he had it all. But pride got into him. And when pride got into him, that's when he rebelled and that's when he fell. And when he fell, according to Revelation chapter 12, he took a third of the angels with him. How many of that comes up in numbers? I have no idea, but I'm sure it's a huge number. And so he has ruled this world ever since. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they handed the authority of their lives over to Satan. Unknowingly, they did that. But as they did that, sin entered the world for the very first time. And Adam and Eve, when they had children, they gave birth to sinful children. It's been like father, like son ever since. You and I have inherited our sin from our original parents, Adam and Eve. That's why God came on this rescue mission and sending his son to rescue us from this. But ever since that day, man just automatically hands the authority of his life over to Satan. They march to his drumbeat. And we'll see more of that as we go on in this class. So for now, Satan is called the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. One day Jesus is going to come back and take that which is rightfully his. He'll take it back. And uh, I can't wait for that day. Our own hearts will make us doubt. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, For the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, I'm not talking about, or the Bible's not talking about this vessel in our chest that beats away. It's this area in our lives that make all of our choices, and believe me, it makes a continual string of choices throughout each day. And we're told that that very center of our lives, that heart, is deceitful above all things <clears throat> and desperately wicked. And no one can know it. Now, the word know in the Hebrew text of that Old Testament verse. 
is a word that speaks of utmost intimacy, like between husband and wife. In other words, we can't know ourselves in a way where we can trust ourselves. Because we ourselves, by nature, are very slippery and deceitful. So we can't even trust. That means we can't trust our feelings. We so often do succumb to our same feelings, you know. Oh, I feel good or I don't feel so good. I feel depressed. I feel up. I feel that. God says we can't trust our feelings. The just shall walk by faith, not by feeling. We've got to trust God's word. We're told that he who trusts his own heart is a fool. But whoever walks wisely will be delivered, Proverbs 28, 26. In Hebrews 3, 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Why Solomon, King Solomon will say, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it proceeds the issues of life. That means we have to be in God's word constantly, even guarding ourselves. Now, let's see what time is. we got time to finish this last verse. Why do I doubt what I'm saying? Because Satan wants you to doubt. Because your own heart will try to make you doubt. And lastly, because you will go back to the old life. I'm sure that some of you can testify to that. We're told here in James 1, 14 to 15, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and types. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. You see, it's a digression. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time for you to fall away from the Lord. But it's little subtle things that get in and begin to play with your mind. We live in a day that, well, I say so often, it's not particularly a blessed time to live on planet Earth. I think with all the materialism, all the gadgets, all the things, all the distractions, I mean, you can go down the road today and cell phones, texting, and the rings, go to the church in the sanctuary, the phones go off and all, there's distractions everywhere, right? I always say, you know, Adam and Eve had it made compared to us today. They only had one tree to worry about. <laughs> we got forbidden fruit everywhere today, right? This is not good, folks. So this is what we're contending with. And that's why it's important to stay in the Word every day. You've got Bibles every day. Get in the Word. Study it. Come to church every time the doors are open. Have a prayer life that just has a list a mile long. And stay in that place before the Lord, in that right relationship with Him, because you've got to guard your own heart. Satan wants to rob you of your peace and your joy and pull you away from the Lord. You see, once you get saved, you enter the marathon. It's a distance race. For some of us, it's a long time. For others, maybe not so long. But nonetheless, it's a marathon. And the real challenge is crossing that finish line one day. Crossing the finish line. So you got to keep your eye on the finish line. That point where God calls us home so that one day when we stand before him we would hear him say well done good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You've got to have farsightedness. John would say in 1 John chapter 3 verse 3 for he who has this hope purifies himself even as he, Jesus, is pure. If we have that hope that is always working in our hearts, then we'll seek to live a pure life before the Lord, an obedient life before him. Well, this has been fun the first night, huh? You guys have been good. Been okay so far? Yes. Coming back next week? Yes. I don't want to lose any of you guys. Right? i got to get to know the rest of you. We got Nancy, we got David, we got Richard, we got Irene, we got Chris, we got Ashley, we got Vic over here, we got Aretha Newton, and we got Precious back there who I also got Newton. Oh, yes, right. <laughs> so we got to have you all back, okay? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. What an awesome night. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Lord, by just what we saw this evening, and what we be experienced. We know that you love us. Not only do we have a testimony of your word, but the fact, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you led us here and put us together shows us your love, and we thank you for that. And now, Father, as we head home and 
Uh, praise the Lord, we've got Friday tomorrow. May it be a glorious day. And may we just shine for you. May others see your glory, your image, as you are stamping that very image upon our lives. And may others see that, Father, and see Jesus in us. And we pray this in his wonderful name. Amen. All right. God bless you.